our honor today to present to you Bill Sofing. Uh, Bill is from Richfield Springs. Uh, he is a retired jeweler from Boston. He worked for the most prestigious jewelry firm in Boston where he uh, regularly worked on uh, wonderful antique pieces of silver, repairing them. He's worked on a number of Revere pieces. Uh, Bill is an expert craftsman, repairman, and an expert on many different facets of 19th century culture and artifacts. And we're very fortunate to have him here today and to talk about 19th century Victorian tea conventions. In the beginning, about 620 AD, the Chinese had discovered about tea. And there were ways you held your cup. And what it was, this is an 18th century teacup. And it's Chinese. And it's very, very thin. I don't know if you can see the light through it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but the proper way to do that was to take your thumb and put it at 6 o'clock on the cup. And take these three fingers and you place them here. You have to remember this tea was hot, so you didn't want to hold your hand on it. And your pinky was out. And then I'll talk to you about pinkies, too. That's Ooh. another thing. But the, uh, the way you would drink this is you would hold this up and then drink it that way. I'm going to put it on the ground, of course. Um, they said the pinky up was part of the balance. I think it's more or less so you can stick it on the hot cup. Uh, <laughs> and this is another example, slightly larger. This one's about 1820, and this is decorated in black. This is also Chinese. Of course, all the tea cups had originally come from China, even when they uh, ended up in Europe. Tea caddies. This is a smaller tea caddy. I acquired this from John, actually. And some of the back, you cleaned it up. <laughs> 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 uh, some of these had compartments in them with little lids on the top. And inside, some of these were lined with tin, and some of them were not. And then they had a caddy spoon. And this stubby little spoon was for this. Some of the other caddies, this is a simpler one, had the two uh, tea reservoirs on each side and had a bowl, which was a mixing bowl in the center. And you could take both of these and mix maybe a little Ceylon tea with a little African tea and make a blend of your own. And then, of course, with this, you would scoop this into the teapot. Uh, women, uh, when eventually, when they were giving little teas at a table, would mix these right at the table. There's two types of teas people generally know, the low tea and the high tea. And everybody thinks the high tea, high class. It has nothing to do with one's class whatsoever. It has to do with the tables. And a high tea is at a high table. And high chairs, such as the dining room right here. Uh, low tea, which is the elegant one, also known as afternoon tea, um, which was done usually in the drawing room. Uh, that was done on low chairs and low tables, and the tea table is lower. In amongst uh, the people who, when they had tea, the middle class people, or if you weren't really wealthy, would have had a nice porcelain tea set, such as this. This is actually uh, made by Theodore Havlin, and some of the, as a matter of fact, these pieces are too. And these are from the 1860s. Uh, they're some of the earliest pieces made by Theodore Howard. Uh, so you would have had your China tea set. Now they say you should never bring the, you should always bring the cup to the pot. But when you had a China tea set, on this one, you know, you could do this. You could pour it in. On a China tea set, you couldn't do that. You pretty much had to set it down because you can hold on to the lid, otherwise it would fall. Even though it has a stop, you couldn't trust that. So you had to hold on to this and then pour the tea. There were also things about how you would uh, hold your tea cup. And if you were at a tea, the saucer was held in your lap. And uh, you would lift the cup with your right hand. Now the hostess, when she was going to pour the tea in there would ask you how many lumps of sugar you like, one or two, or some people took a lot more of that too. And then she would say, no, cream should never be used with tea. Cream is heavy and it masks the flavor of the tea. Coffee is all right, but not tea. Um, the proper way, and I'll use a shallow cup for this, the 
proper way is to take the teaspoon when this is in, you never stir like that. You never make your cup clang either. But what you would do is after the sugar was in, you would go from 6 o'clock to 12 and you, without clicking your spoon against the cup, and you made two or three motions like this to stir the tea. Otherwise, it was considered vulgar. <laughs> Another thing that you would do is there would be a table. The hostess would have a tea service on it. And, uh, and in the great houses, you had something like this. This is a sterling silver tea service. This was made in uh, Philadelphia by uh, George B. Sharp between 1850 and 1860 for Bailey and Company, which became Bailey Banks and Bill. Uh, this is entirely handmade. This would have been for a very wealthy household. And <clears throat> these sets, some of them came with hot water kettles, some of them did not. And this got to be a very involved situation because the hostess is the one who served tea, prepared tea, and I was reading into some of these things, and when the teas got to be very fancy, my God, you couldn't have put it on an ordinary tea table, it wouldn't fit. Uh, there is a controversy about, does the tea, uh, milk go into the cup first, or does it go in second? And I don't think there's any true answer, but there is speculation, because one writer will say, oh no, that's incorrect, the other one will say, it is correct, and the third wouldn't come in and tell you, well, it's all wrong, and you know, so what is right? I don't know. But at any rate, the cups that the poor people had were crockery, like this. And they said there is some idea that they felt that milk was poured in first, because crockery from extreme heat will crack or it will break. So they felt it was to cool it down. But people that are real tea connoisseurs, and they said with the upper classes, uh, will pour the milk in afterwards, because this way you can judge the amount of milk you want in your tea. So, at any rate, that was part of it. Uh, now, there's, there's high tea, which is the one everybody thinks is elegant, but actually that is a tea that is for workers. The people who labored in the fields, the people who worked in the factories, and that was usually served at 6 o'clock in the evening. This really, truly was lower middle class dinner time. And the tables were set up, and I'm going to read off what some of the things that they would have had on their table. They had a lot because they did heavy work during the day and they needed the nourishment. They would have had hot meats, cheese, egg dishes, bread from the oven of wheat, oat, or barley, rare bits, which is, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with uh, Welsh rare bits or things of that nature, but it's cheese done with ale and mustard. And it's done in sauce, served hot, and toast wedges we put in. It's quite delicious in this neighborhood. Mm, um, cool. Cornish, and these, I'm not saying this wrong, they're called pasties. Uh, <laughs> and these were filled, they were little pies filled with meat and vegetables. Yorkshire pudding, uh, I don't know whether, how many of you know what that is, but it's actually bread that is um, saturated with beef drippings. I mean, it's a, it's a killer. Uh, but I imagine it's quite tasty. <laughs> so at least you could die with a funny palate. <laughs> so, um, you would have sweet baked goods, seed cakes like poppy seed cakes and sesame cakes, shortbreads, and crumbled cookies known as fat rascals, and also almond cakes called maids of honor. And these were typical things. There were a lot of other things that were puddings called spotted dick and various other strange things which had little raisins in the spots right there. Um, so this is what they would have done. And they sat at a high dining room table and they had their dinner for the evening. And there would have been in the table a big pot of tea. And this is from the period, and this is a fairly good sized pot of tea. Uh, and this would not have been a wealthy household. This would have been uh, poor people. And done lusterware, some of these were in silver color lusterware, to imitate that. So, that four men silver. Four men silver is basically what that would have been for, and this is copper lusterware. Now, when we were serving tea, there was always tea leaves in it. And so there were little, it was a little inventions like this, which was a tea strainer that would have gone this hairpin-like thing went actually down into the spout. 
so that when you pour the tea into the cup, the tea leaves were automatically collected in there without, uh, without you going through a lot. But the more standard one, which I just pointed out here, was this little thing. It has a drip cup underneath, and you would have placed this over the tea cup and then pour the tea through and simply lift this away. And then this was known, they call it a slop bowl or a waste bowl. A slop bowl sounds kind of disgusting. But you would take and fling it off into there and then do your next cup of tea. And the hostess always did that. A little later, instead of throwing the loose tea right into the pot, the invention of tea boils came out. And they were in various shapes. This is virtually, this is a tea bowl, but some of them were shaped like walnuts and various other things. And these oh, little teapots, miniature teapots. Miniature teapots, yes. And of course you would take and stuff that in. Uh, well, you didn't stuff it too much. You put it halfway. And it would have been for a smaller teapot. There's something like this, you know, a large teapot for it. Because when this gets wet, the tea leaves expand. So, uh, now the thing is when you had tea, there were dessert tables. They weren't kept on the same table as the uh, tea service. And you would go, it must have been a fun time to balance all this stuff. Because aside from your teacup, you would also go to the table, you would take a plate. You would take a napkin. You didn't have to take a spoon because the tea was served to you by the hostess. But you did take a butter spread. Because on the table were jellies, jams and various other spreadable things such as clotted cream and th things of that nature. So you needed to, and you would stack your plate with all these little savories and other fun things to eat. Uh, so there you were, holding your teacup and holding your plate of goodies and holding your napkin and trying to make it back to your chair without spilling or dropping any of it. And there is and things that you've probably all seen the nests of tables where they get progressively smaller. These were pulled out into the room. People would have the little nests of tables around in the chair, sometimes share them or have them as individual things. You really had to. You couldn't eat all that on your lap. Um, you would you would bring the teacup up, but you'd leave this in your lap, you'd drink tea. But the way I'm holding this cup is the proper way. You never stuff your finger through the hole. That was considered uh, probably crude to do that. So the proper way was to take these fingers here, pinch the thing, and use these two to support it underneath. And in, in manners today, that's still considered the proper manner and way to hold it up. Well, your cakes and pastries and things like this would have been served on tiered dishes like this. Savories would have been on the top which would have been things like little cucumber sandwiches and uh, asparagus sandwiches. These were not dinner. These were only meant to tie the over till dinner. And then things like tea cakes. All silver services had a cake basket like this. These were not heavily iced cakes, but they would have been things that were a small cake. They might have been lemon cakes with poppy seeds. They might have had a little powdered sugar on the top, but they would have been stacked in there. And they weren't, all these things were small. All the, t uh, all the sandwiches had the crusts removed. Bread and butter was still always served. We think it was being common sort of thing, but bread and butter is one of the main staples of the tea. And sometimes uh, the bread was actually rolled out with a pin, and butter was slathered on it, and then it was rolled up and sliced the way you would with a uh, jelly cake and lay it there, so you wouldn't have things of that nature. Uh, there would have been flowers. In some cases, if they wanted a really elegant effect, they would have all the curtains on the windows thrown and light candles. Uh, if you had money, sometimes you could afford somebody to play, and I was going to bring that and I forgot to do it, bring a harp and have harp music in the background or maybe a little violin or something like that. So it made the whole thing into a very grand and elegant uh, situation. There was so much controversy about what is right and what is wrong, and it's really very difficult to say what truly is right when it comes to serving and doing all these things, because there are so many opinions 
on this. One thing that is very interesting, if it wasn't for uh, Jane Austen, we would have no idea how tea was served in the early years, but she and her novels wrote uh, about, she was very detailed about how this tea was served and how things were done with it. And because, thanks to Jane Austen, we sort of know how it was done in the earlier years. Coffee was later introduced, but coffee pot would have been kept on a separate table. And that's one of the things I think probably would have driven the hostess nuts because you figure the teapot's cream and sugar and waste bowl is on one table. And somebody wanted coffee, she would have run over to the other table to serve them the coffee. And then you've got a separate table that you've had all the desserts on. Or if you had two or three ladies together, they say you might have had a small tea table, you might have had your whole tea set on there with a few trays such as this on um, there with the various things. Well, originally, uh, sugar came with, uh, in a conical situation which had to be broken up. And uh, so these pieces were broken up into sort of similar sizes. And then, which I didn't mention, and you would use, they, there were two general sizes that were used for the sugar tongs. These little ones, which are about three inches, uh, long, and these which are about six inches long. And you would take, later on, of course, they put them in the mold and they made these little squares that we know of today. And that was